Support comes from Missouri Forest Products Association, committed to sustainable and sound conservation of the state's forests, which support more than 41,000 Missouri jobs, resulting in a $10 billion industry. Choosewood.com. Welcome to St. Louis on the Air. I'm Sarah Fenske. In March, when the pandemic began to shut down businesses across St. Louis, the city announced a moratorium on evictions. They didn't want to see people displaced at a time when sheltering was required. But that moratorium has ended. And on Monday, the St. Louis city courts opened after months of being closed, also due to COVID-19. Housing advocates and the St. Louis Sheriff's Office braced themselves for a surge of evictions. Now, there's been a small reprieve. The same day they opened, the civil court shut down again after an employee tested positive for COVID-19. But on July 6th, the courts are set to open again. And again, those who work on evictions and trying to defend evictions are bracing for a deluge. So joining us today to talk about it is Sheriff Vernon Betts. His office is tasked with carrying out eviction proceedings once they've been ordered by the court. So Sheriff Betts, welcome. Well, glad to be here with you, Sarah. And we're also joined today by Sam Stragan. He's a staff attorney for Metropolitan St. Louis Equal Housing and Opportunity Council, also known as EHOC. Sam, welcome. Uh, Thanks for having me. And last but not least is Lee Camp. He's a staff attorney for Arch City Defenders. Lee, welcome to the show. Hey, thanks for having me, Sarah. So, Sheriff Betts, I want to start with you. You were getting ready to reopen, and almost as fast as you did, the courts closed again. What does that mean for your staff and the work that you have to do as, as far as evictions go? Well, well, actually, all it did was uh, just detained us for a minute. We're set and ready to go. We know that we'll probably get started on the 6th of July if there are no other setbacks and uh my staff has been preparing for this we've uh actually come in early everybody's been been getting themselves together and we're we're getting ready for that workload we uh before we went out on the eviction on, on the pandemic we were up to about 150 evictions we know that that has probably doubled uh, but by the time we get ready to do those evictions, we hope that some of the landlords and some of those situations have been worked out. So we're anticipating about 150 evictions from the start. Hmm. And those 150 evictions, those were things that were somewhat in process and were paused when the pandemic shut everything down? Yes. Most of those had been, uh, all those papers had been processed and previously, and those evictions were about to be uh, started. Okay, so you've got those 150 that have just been sort of waiting for things to reopen. Do you anticipate a large number of cases being filed on top of those? Uh, yeah, we, we do anticipate a, lo- a large case, large number of cases to be uh, processed. Uh, we've gotten, in this last seven weeks while we've uh, postponed evictions, We've had several hundred calls from landlords, hmm. and so uh, we've gone back and forth with landlords that that are upset about not being able to evict the tenant. They and and they're not they don't have any money coming in, as they've said, and so they got a little antsy. They want to evict the people themselves and all that, and we've given them some instructions that that's not legal. They can't do that. They, they can't They can't do it. And so we've had to have that conversation with our landlords and kind of give them some directions. They're going to have to hold on until the legal process starts by the courts and by the sheriff and uh, not to move forward in locking anybody out or, or changing the locks on doors and or trying to evict anybody because then that becomes an illegal situation. Mm-hmm. And Lee, I know that you um, have dealt with many of these illegal situations over the years as an attorney for Arch City Defenders trying to stop them. But but I'm curious what you're hearing now from clients. Are people worried about this wave of legal evictions that could be coming? Yeah, absolutely. Um, people are worried about them. And, and honestly, we're worried about them, too, the advocates that work on these issues. I spend the majority of my days now on phone calls with people like Sam and advocates around the city and the county and the country um, just talking about what this is actually going to look like. And, and we truly fear that there will be a wave of evictions that are filed on the back end of, of the pandemic and are chiefly concerned as the courts open and not only as the sheriff's department begins processing the evictions 
that have already gone through their judicial process and proceedings, but all of the new cases that have been pending during this time, and then the, the really the, the wave of cases that we believe will be filed as some of the protections for tenants and some of the economic um, stimulus uh, things are, are ending um, right. really at the end of July. We really think that that's the point that we're going to see an uptick in evictions that will be massive and, and difficult to handle. Sam, um, are you hearing many calls from people who are worried that they could be affected by this? Yes. Um, yes, absolutely. I mean, basically every call that we take in at our agency involves some level of worry about uh, what's going to happen with evictions and when the courts reopen. Of course, a lot of people are behind on rent for very understandable reasons. Um, they're also worried about, you know, what their landlord could possibly do. Uh, several have received, of course, threats of the illegal lockouts that um, Sheriff Betts was talking about. And so that's always a worry for us as well. Hmm. So tell me about these illegal lockouts. I mean, if you hear from somebody that their landlord has been trying to boot them during this moratorium or that this isn't the sheriff's department handling this, someone is just uh, has gone rogue in some way. What can people do to push back on that? So, so well, it's important to, to me. To, you want to get that from the legal, because I can also add to the, you know, give you some background on that. We've been because we've been getting hundreds of calls along those same lines, hmm. and we've been advising, and and the, the two attorneys can tell me if I'm doing something wrong. But we've been advising the folks that you cannot proceed with an illegal lockout. It's only by court order, and by the execution of. The sheriff department are the only somebody that can evict anybody from, from their from their property, and so we've been telling those landlords who seem to who seem to really be antsy about getting these people out of their property, they're just going to have to wait. Now, what what uh, and we've got a lot of those calls on both sides. Hmm. Can as we've even gotten calls from from tenants who said. Well, you know, since the pandemic is going on, I don't have to pay any rent at all. And we've said, well, no, that's not the case either. If you got it, you have to pay it. But right now, there are are some uh, uh, some some stand downs that uh, you don't have to pay. Well, you didn't have to pay while we were under the pandemic, but now mm-hmm. since everything's been lifted, then you're going to have to make some arrangements to get get payment in. Yeah, I think that's a that's an excellent point. Sam, I, I want to take that to you. Is what Sheriff Betts been telling people, is that correct? Is that in line with what you've been telling your clients? A- absolutely. And it's important to note that in the city of St. Louis, there's actually an ordinance uh, that allows for a fine of up to $500 or 90 days in jail for a landlord that illegally locks out somebody. So that's, you know, the changing of the locks, but also if they turn off any utilities or throw people's stuff out. Any of that is covered by that ordinance. And so, um, you know, if need be, the authorities should be able to get involved in in those situations. Okay. And and Lee, in your experience, are the authorities willing to get involved in those situations? Sometimes it comes down to to a reality that's different than what's on the books. Yeah, I I think that's very true. Um, Evictions generally in, in our sphere are understood to be kind of civil processes. And Really, that's the way that my office approaches them, too. Um, in addition to what Sam is talking about, there's actually civil penalties that you can face um, if, if a tenant was to bring a lawsuit against the landlord for one of these illegal lockouts. And so, I mean, I, I think the totality of when we get to that point as a community is we're at a very violent place. These are very violent things when someone is illegally thrown out of their home, um, not necessarily through... Uh, violent means that that occurs, but but the action itself has a devastating effect on the families, um, and and we really are hopeful that those things will will subside a little bit and engage in conversations with landlords as well to try to educate them that just throwing someone out of your property in this very moment is not going to be the answer that we're all looking for here. And, and Lee, you've seen people go through an eviction. What kind of impact does that have on a family uh, when something like this is, is final and, and goes down? Yeah, I, I, we, we frequently borrow um, a line from the book Evicted that the eviction itself is not the period on the end of a sentence. It's actually the start of a cycle of poverty frequently for people and being thrust into this situation of housing instability and homelessness 
I mean, it, it has truly devastating impacts um, on that family, on the children in the family as they move from schools or they lose the comforts of their own neighborhoods and, and whatnot. Um, it, it really rattles your foundational understanding of what life is like day to day. Mm -hmm. um, and it could be just it, some people uh, truly can never get over that. Others, you know, get trapped in this cycle and are used to it. And that, that's heartbreaking to see someone actually become numb to the fact that they go through this cycle of evictions over and over again. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. We're actually optimistic maybe this pandemic will, will be a point where we're all pausing and revisiting the very thing that we're doing, taking housing away from people in our communities. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Sarah, not, just, just to interject, you know, I, the sheriff, I've been out on those evictions myself as a deputy and even as the sheriff, and it, it, it's really traumatizing. Hmm. especially when you go to these eviction sites and you have little children involved. We, the sheriff department, take it very serious. We don't take it lightly. We try to be as sympathetic and as empathetic as we possibly can. Uh, but, of course, we have court order that we have to follow. So we got, some, we got some plans and some ideas that I'll share with you as we continue with the conversation. Okay, and I'd, I'd love to do that. Uh, we do need to take a quick break now, but before we go to that break, I want to invite our listeners to join this conversation. I know we already have a couple who are eager to jump in, and we'll get to that after the break. But if you've struggled to make rent since the pandemic started, and maybe you have a question about your rights in that situation, we'd love to hear from you. Or maybe you're a landlord. You're having trouble paying your mortgage. You're wondering how you fit into all this. You can join our conversation by calling 314-382-8255. That's 382-TALK. Or you can email Email us at talk at stlpublicradio.org. And, of course, we're talking about this, uh, what could be an eviction crisis with Sheriff Vernon Betts, as well as Sam Strickand. He's a staff attorney uh, for Metropolitan St. Louis Equal Housing and Opportunity Council and Lee Camp of Arch City Defenders. I'm going to take that quick break now, but we'll be back very shortly to continue this conversation. This is St. Louis on the Air on St. Louis Public Radio. That's 90.7 KWMU. Support comes from Missouri Forest Products Association, committed to sustainable and sound conservation of the state's forests, which support more than 41,000 Missouri jobs, resulting in a $10 billion industry. Choosewood.com. Welcome back. We're talking about what advocates fear will be a big surge in evictions now that courts are beginning to reopen and the moratorium has lifted. And my guests today are St. Louis City Sheriff Vernon Betts. His office carries out eviction proceedings here. We're also joined by two lawyers who try to help people who are facing foreclosure. One is Sam Stragand. He's a staff attorney for Metropolitan St. Louis Equal Housing and Opportunity Council, better known as EHOC. And we're also joined by Lee Camp of Arch City Defenders. We have a lot of people who want to join this conversation. I'm just going to go straight to the phone lines. Um, Steve is calling from St. Charles. Um, Steve, hi. You're on St. Louis on the Air. Yeah, I'm one of those mean old landlords that filed for eviction oh, prior to the pandemic. And I've just been laughed at for the past seven months. Because the courts, you know, had to shut down, obviously. Mm -hmm. And... You know, I just wanted to remind people that we're not all, you know, just evicting people left and right. Mm -hmm. um, so you you've know. had to put that whole thing on pause during this pandemic. Have you been able to pay your mortgage during that time? Yeah, I mean, I can't risk my my credit scores and all that stuff and late fees and all that. So, yeah, I've been paying it, but not collecting. Mm hmm. No, that's that's tough. And, and I have some sympathy for that. Um, Sheriff Betts, I'm wondering, for, you said you've heard from so many of these landlords. Do you kind yeah. of feel like they're in a, a rock and a hard place? Yeah, yeah. We've been we've been getting a lot of calls from landlords and uh, uh, to the point where some of them are threatening to do some of those illegal actions that we talked about. But no, they have their rights and we're going to uh, proceed and make sure that everybody uh, have the rights taken care of on both sides. We'll do our best to make sure everybody gets a fair shake mm -hmm. in this thing. So those people who filed before the pandemic, those are going to be the first 
uh, uh, wave of evictions that we kind of work on. Mm -hmm. Uh, Steve, thank you for that perspective. And I do want to mention census data shows that just over half of U.S. rental units are owned by business entities. The other 22.7 million rental units are owned by individuals. Uh, They often own single units or homes or duplexes. They really are mom and pop landlords. Um, Lee Camp, any thoughts on on what they can do in cases like this where they might feel really bad for their tenant, but they're also kind of freaking out about their mortgage? Yeah, I I think that's a very important point is um, the fact that right now uh, tenants and landlords find themselves connected in a way that they previously weren't. Um, And and I'm glad that that Steve can pay his mortgage, but I I know for a fact that there are individuals and landlords, those small mom mom and pops that are are having difficulties making those payments. Um, And so really, I, I think the the answer to this situation is going to have to be some sort of a policy fix. Um, it's not going to be fixed by lawyers or the sheriff. It's it's going to take money and it's going to take bold leadership. Um, you know, delegating and prioritizing this crisis that we're in, because we know if the tenants cannot make their rental payments, we start to watch the dominoes fall. The landlords fall behind on their mortgages. Um, then the banks are foreclosing on those properties. This leads to an economic impact in the cities around their ability to bring in money on property taxes and, and et cetera. And that, that filters out into a, a variety of other, you know, costs for us as a community. So really, um, we're all tied in this thing together. And really based on conversations that I'm having with landlords and their attorneys right now, we're, we're really looking to be creative and find, find a way that, that everyone, can win in this situation if it's possible, but it's not easy. And it's really going to take some bold leadership and some some prioritization of this crisis that we're in. Sam, um, in your in your perspective, are there any policy changes that you've heard about or, or seen people talking about that could help make a difference here? Sure, definitely. I So one thing to point out as far as from the landlord side is that the vast majority of homeowners or property owners Uh, have banks and mortgage holders that are offering some level of forbearance, um, you know, at least for a a, a monthly period. And so I suggest for all the landlords to contact their mortgage holders to to see what can be done on that side. Having said that, of course, that doesn't mean, you know, that that will last forever or that anything is forgiven. Um, And so I think a big part of the policy fix is, is direct assistance to tenants and landlords financially. Um, There's a lot of of funding that's coming from the federal and state governments and it's trickling down to the cities and counties uh, in our area but it's taking a while i know that's frustrating to everybody but i do foresee in the next couple of months that there will be significantly more assistance available so something i would Mm -hmm. suggest is you know work with your tenants if your landlords if your tenants work with your with your landlords and uh, a few months from now i think that you will be able to work on some uh, uh, payment plans that will have more assistance available in that time period. Okay. I want to go back to the phone lines. Maria is calling from St. Louis. Um, Maria, hi, you're on St. Louis on the air. Hi, thank you for taking my call. Hey, question for you. Um, regarding squatters and property owners in this pandemic time, mm-hmm. um, do the squatters have any rights and what kind of rights do property owners have? So you mean somebody who has just uh, moved into a place that they never had a lease for? Uh, no, my father has a empty property in St. Louis City, and somebody has taken residence. Mm. And the police have been called to remove them, but they said that uh, the mayor has stated that she didn't want them to be arrested for these type of offenses. Hmm. Well, that's interesting. That question is is totally new to me. Um, Lee, is this is any insight for Maria on what could happen here? I hate to put you on the spot, but... Yeah, and, and particularly I focus on the rights of those that would be occupying that property, so it's it's difficult there. I can't say, though, to her her point about the mayor putting on a hold. Really, these where the courts are in this holding process is uh, that that's governance from the, the state Supreme Court. It's not necessarily local governance that are keeping court proceedings closed in the you event that, that they wanted to go to court for this issue, but... Um, really, it's a statewide order that we're under right now that are keeping our courts closed at this moment. Um, and, and again, even a situation like this where 
I would I would argue that someone is probably out on their luck if they are in that situation. Um, it's gonna it's not an easy one to deal with in this time where we can't use our normal remedies and protections under the law as we would have in February or January. Mm-hmm. Sheriff Betts, any thoughts on this situation that Maria is dealing with? Yeah, well, well, one, I don't know if you just heard, and I, I hated to interject, but I was saying Lee is exactly right in what he's saying, uh, that this has been a not, a, not a, not the circuit court, but the federal courts have given us these directions on what we needed to do is come down from the, from the Supreme Court. And so we do have uh, specific instructions as to uh, what we have to do during the p- pandemic. But uh, when we talk about those squatters, and I'll check into it, uh, the squatters, I'm not sure if they have legal right. Mm-hmm. Uh, even though we're under the pandemic, they don't have a right to, to inhabit the, the, the person's property. Now, I'm not sure if there's response. Uh, if they've called the police and the police have not responded, I'll look into that, and maybe the next time I'm interviewed by somebody, I'll have an answer as to that might be a situation where, uh, since the sheriff is the legal person that evicts, we may have to look into when people have this situation, they call the sheriff department, and then we carry out whatever law or legal legality that needs to be carried out in that case. Okay, so you'll be looking into that. Well, I, I appreciate yes. you your willingness to do that. And Maria, I hope that gives you some comfort to know the sheriff is, is going to see what he can do here. Um, for those who are just tuning in, my guests today are Sheriff Vernon Betts, as well as Sam Stragand, a staff attorney for EHOC, and also Lee Camp of Arch City Defenders. Lee and Sam, I want to go back to you for a minute here. We're talking about this, um, how these eviction proceedings work in court. Um, I saw a study of eviction court outcomes in Kansas City. This was from 2006 to 2016. And it showed that over 99 percent of eviction cases went against the tenant. Sam, is it your sense that St. Louis would see similar numbers? Uh, Absolutely. Actually, um, we uh, were working with a case a few years ago that Lee Camp represented on that went to the Missouri Supreme Court in which we did a study in which we looked at 2012 numbers in the city of St. Louis. And we found similarly that there were um, almost 4,000 judgments for uh, the landlords in the city of St. Louis and only two judgments in favor of the tenants during mm-hmm. that time period. Wow. Um, so it is very similar as far as the statistics goes. And you got to remember that's in part because um, the vast majority of landlords are represented by attorneys and, you know, fewer than 2% of tenants are represented by attorneys. So if people so end up in, if people end up in one of these situations where a formal proceeding is being made against them, um, what advice would you have for them? I understand that it's complicated. It probably comes down to the individual situation, but is there anything that would be a good starting point for people? Sure. So one of the things I always suggest is that um, they attempt to, of course, negotiate with the landlord. Uh, one of the programs that uh, I'm involved in rolling out is offering mediations uh, pre-filing, right? So before the landlord even files in court, they would talk to an organization um, like the St. Louis Mediation Project or the uh, Conflict Resolution Center in the city, and they offer mediators uh, you know, for free who will try to work out something between the landlord and the tenant. Um, if that, of course, doesn't work, they of course should pursue legal representation if they can. Unfortunately, uh, you're talking to you know uh, one of two of only a couple of of, of of attorneys who represent tenants, but hopefully we'll get some more um, <laughs> as some of the funding comes through. And so I'd suggest trying to talk to an attorney if you can about your legal case. Um, and but again, the entire time I would suggest keeping the lines of communication open with your landlord about you know negotiating when payments can be made um, and just keeping everybody apprised of what's going on. Hmm. Lee, any advice you'd want to add to that? No, I I think that's that's correct. Um, And it does highlight the point that um, there there really was this eviction crisis already occurring uh, before this pandemic in, in terms of the success rate of tenants. And I would very much echo Sam that there's not a lot of success on the tenant side. And, and a lot of that comes from the ways that the laws are designed in our state and really around the country to handle these matters. But because they do move very quickly, um, if you find the sheriff delivering a summons to your home or a process server posting something on your door, I would absolutely pick up the phone and, and call one of our agencies or try to find um, anyone that you know that could help you with that case that, that may be an attorney 
they're they're very difficult and they move quickly. They usually take legal advice because of the specific facts hmm. underlying every matter. Now, Sheriff Betts, I know you were saying that these cases, they're so hard for you to see go down. You said especially when children are involved. And there are some things your office is, is trying to do to help approach what, what could be this surge. Um, what, what are some of those things that you guys are working on? Well, well uh, Sarah, what we've done is sat down with uh, the presiding judge and, and uh, some of the, the supervisors of the eviction department. And we're going to try to, along with the courts, come up with a, a listing of resources that when we come, that the first step in that process to serve the notice, it's not the actual eviction itself, but to serve the notice, we're going to try to, along with serving that notice, provide a list of resources for folks that they can uh, call to try to get some assistance. And, of course, now now that I've been introduced to Lee and to Sam, <laughs> they, they will probably be on that list of resources that we're going to try to uh, come up with uh, that we can give to the uh, tenant uh, and maybe help them out uh, with, with this eviction process. That's great to hear. So the first stage of this, you guys are serving notice to people that, hey, your landlord is going to be in court to try to evict you. So if you could get those resources to them, then you could maybe head some things off before they get to that point where you're showing up to have to move them out. Is that the idea? That, that, that's the idea. And, and actually, the, as the process works, uh, once the, t- the landlord comes down to file, that landlord and the tenant will be given a court date where they both will have to come uh, to court and before a judge, and he'll make a, a determination. Probably at that point, we're going to see if we can put something in the hands of the tenant if they're having those financial problems that might help them uh, get some resources to help them out of that situation. Hmm. Well, that's that's great to hear that you guys are working on that. And Lee, I know that bigger picture, there's also people who are advocating for some of these changes that you guys are talking about today. If people are feeling inspired to try to get involved with these issues, um, are there any organizations that you'd point to that are doing good work on this? Yeah, I, I would absolutely encourage people to get um, involved with, with groups like ours. Um, Follow us on Facebook. Follow us on Twitter. We're actively pushing out different campaigns that we're engaged in and whatnot. And then eHawk as well, particularly on the, the fair housing side. Um, we're, we're constantly working with different community groups um, and activists that are really moving into this space as it's becoming uh, more top of mind for individuals, how fragile it has been um, and how we really do need to rethink the way that we are handling these issues of housing in our community. Um, you know, our, our organization is signed on and are a partner in the campaign to close the workhouse. One of the main pillars of that campaign is we should reimagine public safety here. And that means divesting money from systems that harm our community and putting them into systems that encourage healthy outcomes in vibrant communities. And so we can connect you to all those different things. We just invite you to engage with us um, on at Arch City Defenders on Facebook or Twitter, and we'll get you connected. Well, Lee Camp of Arch City Defenders, I want to thank you so much for joining us today and, and sharing that perspective. Thank you. And Sam Stragand of the Metropolitan St. Louis Equal Housing and Opportunity Council, uh, thank you for joining us today. Thank you for having me. And as Lee had said, if you want more information about what either of these groups are doing um, on this on this issue, we'd encourage you to reach out to get to them. Again, that's Arch City Defenders and that's EHOC. They're both doing a lot of work with renters. And Sheriff Vernon Betts, I want to thank you so much for joining us. Sarah, well, thank you so much for giving us the opportunity to speak to this issue. We don't want to be known as the uh, sheriff department that put people out on the street. We want to be known as the uh, sheriff department that has empathy and sympathy for our citizens of St. Louis, and we are here to help assist the, the citizens in any way that we possibly can. If they can't get a hold of Lee and they can't get a hold of Sam, they can call the sheriff department, and we'll try to help in every way that we can. Well, that is great to hear, and, and we're going to hold you to that. Um, for all St. Louis on the Air listeners, uh, Sheriff Betts is there to help you, and, and we appreciate that. So this is St. Louis on the Air on St. Louis Public Radio. That's 90.7 KWMU.
Support comes from the Missouri Forest Products Association, providing more than 41,000 jobs in the production of wood pallets, railroad ties, white oak barrels, hardwood floors, and more. Details at ChooseWood.com.